Welcome to the second um, webinar for the core trustee um, cohort. Um, because this is being recorded, I think we'll go ahead and get started because people can always catch up with the first part if they haven't gotten here yet. Today we have two speakers, um, Ingrid Dillo, who's the Deputy Director of DANS, which is the Data Archiving and Network Services in the Netherlands. She's also on the Core Trust SEAL Board. And our second speaker will be Helen Glaves, Senior Data Scientist at the British Geological Survey. Um, they'll do their presentations and then there'll be time for, time for questions at the end of each of those presentations. So Ingrid, would you like to get started? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. And um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you um, this morning a little bit about uh, the experiences that we have um, at my institution at DANCE around uh, the topic of certification of our repository. Um, let me see whether I can go to the next slide. This should work. Yes, there we are. Um, first of all, a little bit about the Institute, because I'm not sure that you um, all know about DANCE. So DANCE is a data service provider in the Netherlands. And we like to say that we are all about keeping data fair with um, an emphasis on the word keeping, because we are a long-term archive. We have a very broad mission to promote and provide permanent access to digital research resources. And we are a national institute, an institute both of the Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the National Research Council, NWO. And we have been around since 2005, and we have strong roots in the social sciences and humanities, because that is where we originally come from. And we even have digital data that go back to um, the uh, to 1964 our older social sciences data so we know a little bit about long-term preservation um, but over the years we have evolved in a much more generic um, institute and we offer quite generic services we have our long-term data vault for long-term preservation of data we also are the national host in the Netherlands for um, Dataverse. So most of the um, universities, a couple of higher education institutions and other um, research institutes use Dataverse for the um, um, storage of data during research and the first period after research. Um, we also host um, the national research portal in the Netherlands called NARSIS which contains information on Dutch publications, Dutch research data, but also on researchers, research institutions and research projects. And we are also um, an important partner when it comes to training and consultancy in the area of research data management and um, data curation and preservation. So DANS and certification, um, there are two strands you could say along which we are involved in the certification business. First of all, um, a very important one is that we are the founding father of the data seal of approval. Right from the start, DANS was asked by its um, founding fathers to think about requirements along which our data archive could be um, assessed. And that was the very first step in uh, the direction of what would later become the data seal of approval. We handed over um, our catalog of requirements to an international board somewhere around 2007, I think. And from that moment on, uh, the data seal of approval became one of the certification, the, the core certification um, uh, mechanisms for digital repositories. We have also been involved in the development of other standards. Um, we have been involved in the, the Nestor seal, the DIN standard, and also in um, the certification around uh, the world data system, um, both of which you have heard something, I think, in the first webinar given by Rory Edmonds. Um, and we are also at the moment very involved in the certification activities within uh, the context of the Research Data Alliance, um, where I also co-chair an interest group in the area of certification. So, on the one hand, we are involved uh, from the angle of, of, of um, the, the development of the standards themselves. On the other hand, we have also always um, made sure that we um, cert try to certify our own DANS long-term repository, our data vault. And um, 
I want to lay the focus on that second strand in this presentation and tell you a little bit about how we have been handling all of that in practice. So here you see a short overview of what we have done in recent years. 2011 has been an important year because then we decided to really make um, the certification of our repository an important strategic tar target in our long-term policy. Um, we um, acquired the uh, data seal of approval and we also were one of the guinea pigs in the first or, uh, tests or uh, test audits around the new ISO standard 16363 for repositories that uh, came into being around that time. That was an important test audit for us because um, we could very make very good use of the outcomes um, to improve our repository. In 2013, we had a renewal procedure for the DSA seal and the two years after that, we um, acquired the Nestor seal and we also became a member of uh, the World Data System, which also required the certification uh, procedure of the World Data System itself. And last year we, oh, no, it was this year, last year we did the work for our Core Trust Seal um, certification and we acquired that, I think it was in January of this year. So we have been active in this area for quite some time and have um, really gained some, some insight into um, what all of this entails. So what are we talking about in practice if we talk about certification? First of all, I think that um, it's important to um, be aware of the fact that a certification um, has a very broad scope. It is not just about digital object management. It's not just about your technical infrastructure. It really involves a broad range of topics, concerns all kinds of aspects around your organization, staffing, financial aspects, legal aspects, your archival workflows, uh, risk management is also important, um, continuity planning, etc, etc. So a broad range of, of aspects uh, come into play when you uh, go for a certification. Um, very often it entails um, properly describing all kinds of policies and processes. Very often these processes um, are maybe in place, are in the heads of people, of your archivists, but very often we see that um, they are not available um, in documentation. And finally, um, sometimes it is even the case that certain policies that you would need do not yet exist, or processes, or certain elements in your infrastructure, etc., etc. So, um, when you start a work like this, you really need to look into uh, more or less every corner of, of, of your archive, of your organization. Um, furthermore, I think it's good to take into account a number of organizational aspects. What I have experienced is that it is very important if you start um, a process like this, um, that there is um, a responsibility, a commitment on management level within an organization. And this has to do with the fact that a lot of the work that needs to be done might not be um, at the top of the priority list of, of an organization. Very often it concerns work that people could consider as a kind of back office work that is not that important maybe, and that is not so visible um, once you have done it. So it's very important to have this commitment on management level. Then what we have always done in, in um, processes like this within dance is that we um, set up a kind of core certification team. A limited number of people that you really make responsible for the process, that have responsibility with respect to the planning, um, making sure that the right discussions take place, making sure that progress of the work is monitored. And uh, of course, these people also play a very important role in actually executing the work that needs to be done. Because you deal with such a broad range of aspects also means very often, implies very often, that you will probably need a lot of colleagues to be involved with a kind of specific expertise um, at certain at uh, um, certain points um, in the process. So at one point you might need someone who has um, legal um, expertise. Uh, for another element you need someone who um, knows all about finance. So you need many, 
you will probably need many colleagues to fill out the complete picture, but it is good to have um, two or three people that really carry the responsibility of, of um, pulling this off. Um, so this combination within us, with a, with the core group and, a, and a, a layer around that of people that come and go, uh, really worked um, nicely. So when you talk about effort, what would it involve? Um, of course, that the, the, the amount of effort that is needed to go through a certification really depends on your level of entry. You could really say that if you have already everything in place and you um, comply with every requirement that is needed, then you could probably write the self-assessment and gather the documentation and the necessary links in, in two weeks. But very often that, of course, is not the case. And of course, the effort will rise if you still need to write policies or maybe even define policies. Maybe you need to, to still build certain parts of the infrastructure. All of that, of course, quickly um, raises the effort that is needed. The other element that is of important, of course, is that if you go for the core trust, that is a core level um, certification, um, and that means that the effort um, is relatively limited if you go up the certification ladder and you go to the um, more extensive certifications like the Nestor seal and maybe even the ISO standard, then of course the effort um, goes up really quickly. Um, if you go for the ISO standard, that really entails a lot of, lot of work um, with more, over 100 requirements and um, an audit commission um, that comes into your institute, etc. That is really um, a completely um, other um, kind of, of, of effort. Um, so the core trust seal really is, is the baseline, you could say, and then it really depends on where you stand at the start of, of, of the process. And I'll get back to that later on. So to give you an example, we have tried to, to uh, record all the hours that we spent on our renewal of the data seal of approval in 2013. Um, the DSA at that time had a two year life cycle. And of course, the data seal of approval looked very much like the current core trust seal. It also had 16 requirements, core level uh, certification. So we had to go through it again. We went back to our first um, self-assessment um, and revisited that text and the supporting materials. And we looked at the revised guidelines that were available in 2013 and what needed to be adjusted on the basis of that. We looked at the comments and the recommendations that we got in the review. And we looked at the um, present situation of our institute, of the developments in the last two years. And all of that um, was taken into account. And it still took us 200, around 250 hours of work um, to um, put in our new um, um, application for the data seal of approval. And here you can see the division of hours. So um, some of the hours went into um, work around our policies. We needed to do some technical work that took most of the hours. The production of the self-assessment itself took quite, uh, quite a lot of hours and there was a tiny bit for um, the management of this whole little project. It gives you some idea of what we're talking about. I also want to show you a number of figures that were produced in 2016. Um, in that year, the National Coal Digital Preservation Coalition in the Netherlands sent out a survey, survey to all the data seal of approval seal holders. So organizations that were successful in getting the DSA seal, and that is something you need to keep in mind because the, the organizations that didn't make it are not in these figures. So these figures are a little bit flattered. Um, but here you can see what those, all of those seal holders said about the level of investment in getting the uh, seal. Um, they said that the first, the orientation phase took them um, around um, uh, 20 hours. The preparation of the self-assessment itself took 50% of the interviewees uh, up to 100 hours and 30% up to 200 hours. And then you can see that also the peer reviews process, which usually is an iterative process going up and down, also took around, um, well, um, between 50 and 200 hours. So um, the estimation that we had for our seal really, um, uh, I think, aligns quite nicely with, uh, with um, inventory of um, seal holders. Um, 
now I try to go to the next slide. Yes, another example. I, I already showed you that dance also went through the Nestor Seal certification. That is an extended certification based on 34 criteria. Um, and these criteria are defined by, and the, the procedures are defined by the Nestor Group in Germany. It's a, a, an international standard, but mainly now used only in Germany. Um, but it's, it's more elaborate than the Core Trust Seal. Um, it is also based on a self-assessment that is then reviewed by two reviewers. And um, if you pass for all of that, you get the next Nestor seal um, and that is given to you indefinitely. So it is not like the core trust seal, the seal that you get for three years. But of course, you can imagine that if you don't renew this seal um, after five years or even then certainly 10 years, it isn't worth anything anymore. Anyway, we went through that process. Um, and the good thing, of course, was and is that those criteria in the Nestor seal build on the work that you already have done in um, the data seal of approval or nowadays the core trust seal. But still, it required us a major effort. We, it took us around 1500 hours of work and around half of all the colleagues at DANS at that time, around 50 people were involved in some way at some point in the, pro in the process. So this really was a major effort. And here you see um, the effort um, um, divided, um, the hours we needed divided to the, uh, the different activities um, that we undertook around policies, around um, uh, workflows in our repository, the technical infrastructure um, and the work for the self-assessment itself and all the internal consultation around the text, the project management. So you can see that this really has been a major project um, and it took us a lot more than I expected um, when we started this. Um, there was a lot of overhead because you deal with so many people within this in the institute. The good thing of it was that we got a lot of work done that we in the back office that wouldn't have been possible would be my guess um, if we hadn't had this um, specific goal of getting this seal. <clears throat> so why do repositories invest in certification efforts? These are also um, the main uh, elements that came out of a survey amongst DSA seal holders. And I think um, Rory talked about this in the first webinar already. Um, so very important for people is that you build stakeholder confidence in the repository, um, not only uh, with the depositors and users of the data, but also with the funders and publishers. You raise awareness about digital preservation and the importance of data management. It improves communication within the repository because you need to work together to, to make all of this um, happen. It improves repository processes. It ensures transparency. And that is, I think, um, of vital importance when you want to build trust with your stakeholders in your repository. And it, of course, also gives you the opportunity to differentiate yourself from other repositories. Um, in that survey, we also asked people about their, the perceived benefits of um, core certification. And you can see that you see the same elements um, coming back here in 2016. Um, they talk about the awareness raising, about digital preservation, stakeholder confidence, but also about more internal benefits, um, improved internal processes and documentation, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> So there are two, um, two angles um, to the benefits that, um, that people see for certification. When I um, look at um, our own institute and why do we do it at DANS, of course, it, for us, it is also a way to build trust in our repository with um, all of these stakeholder groups. But I think even more important is um, certification for us and for me as a kind of big stick in a positive way to further develop and professionalize our core services, our workflows and our organization as a whole. Um, when you go, um, when you decide on management level to go uh, for this, um, you really do get things done that probably wouldn't have been done or would not have been done so quickly um, without this process. It really helps to get um, to really lift your organization up to a to a higher professional level. 
when we look at the overall judgment that um, seal holders give, then they usually say that um, they uh, that the benefits um, are tangible and are even critical to the continuing fulfillment of their mission. I think that is um, that is really important. And they also say that um, the ratio between the investment that it takes and the benefits that you get back are either adequate rewarding to rewarding excellence. So that really means that um, the investment, um, that it's worth the investment. And another very significant thing that came out of that survey is that um, there were hardly any repositories that after um, getting their data seal of approval, so their core level certification, um, aimed to go for a higher level um, certification the Nestor seal or maybe the ISO um, standard and um, this of course was um, a survey in 2016. I must say that now two years later I don't see um, a lot of difference there. We don't see a lot of uptake um, of the Nestor seal. Uh, there are a couple of repositories certified in Germany and um, Dans is the only one outside of Germany. The ISO standard is now also um, available and um, in action. Um, there, up till now, there is only one archive in India that has the ISO standard certification. So, um, Portra Seal really um, is the one that most of the repositories are, are aiming at. So, what would be my main takeaways? My main takeaways takeaway would be. Um, Always start with an internal quick scan to determine the level of entry against the catalog of requirements of the core trust seal. If you think about going um, um, for this process, just have some people um, sit in a room for um, half a day and try to work through the requirements and see where you stand now and, and make a quick um, assessment of what needs to be done and on the basis of that you can decide whether should, you should go for uh, the formal certification or whether it's better to maybe wait um, a little bit and work on certain aspects beforehand. But even without formal certification, the requirements can be used as a benchmark opportunity to identify gaps that you might have and, and areas that where you need to focus your attention to. Like I said, management commitment in my from my point of view is crucial to make this a success and you need also a broad support within the organization because many people simply will be needed um, to uh, fill out the self-assessment and finally do not aim, aim um, too high at once um, start with the core trust seal and then um, if needed you can um, build on the work that you have done there to go for a higher level certification and here you find um, the link also to the, um, do I have it on here, the, to the um, uh, NCDD um, survey um, that is available. So with that, um, I think I have um, told you anything, told you everything I wanted to tell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. Does anybody have questions for Ingrid? We have time for a few. And I'll wait while you unmute. Okay, well, let's go ahead with our next presentation. Um, Helen, are you ready? I am, yes. I'm just waiting for someone to uh, give me the, the uh, presenters. Okay. okay. That's, that's good. Okay, let me just get into presentation mode. Okay. Just going to think about it for a second. Okay, can you now see my screen in full presentation mode? Not yet. Perfect, great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Actually, um, Helen, we can't see it. You can't? Oh. No, I can. That's weird. Okay, let me try that again. If that doesn't work, I can bring up your slides. You may need to push the share, to click the share button, Helen. Yeah, I already did that and it, ah, now it did. Yeah, it said it was sharing, but I don't think it was. Okay, okay. I can see your screen now. 
you can you just, see it now. Yeah, just need to be in presentation mode. Yeah, just take there we go. Can you see Great. it now? Perfect, thank you. Great, fantastic. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna follow on from Ingrid by saying a few words about the experience of um, going through the Core Trust SEAL certification process from the perspective of the uh, National Geoscience Data Center in the UK. And I think you'll probably find as I'm going through our experience that a lot of what I'm gonna say um, kind of echoes um, some of the comments that Ingrid has made. And, and I think this is actually quite important that there is a, you know, a, a common understanding of, of the way that uh, people need to approach certification and the importance of certification uh, and the process itself. So let me just try and move forward in my slides. I'm gonna start off just by giving you a little introduction for those of you who don't know anything about the UK Ge National Geoscience Data Center um, essentially, we are um, we are part of the British Geological Survey in the UK, and we are a data centre for all of the subsurface data. Um, there has actually been a repository at the British Geological Survey, uh, or one of its previous incarnations, since um, uh, the survey began in 1835. And I think it's fair to say that we could be considered a government funded designated domain repository. And our remit um, clearly states that we provide a safe place of deposit for, for geoscience data. So one of the things to note is that, that our longevity does mean that we have a large amount of different types of data, which ranges from analog, analog material. But more recently, we are now uh, accumulating significant volumes of digital data some of this is collected by the scientists who work for the geological survey um, but it's worth also saying that a lot of it is also acquired um, through either various legis legislative obligations or actually donated from various sources so for example we have um, citizen science data which comes from a range of apps including something uh, called iGeology but we're also increasingly involved with um, real-time and near real-time data streams from a variety of instruments. And so we're actually increasing the volumes of data we hold significantly um, on a daily basis. So moving on to, to say something about what has motivated the repository um, to, to start looking at how we operate and the need for having standards. And a lot of this is actually because increasingly we're required to justify our funding and the very our very existence to our funders and also the services that we provide to our users. So fundamentally, we really need to provide data producers and researchers with reassurance that their data will be well managed. But at the same time, we have to ensure that our funders are confident that the data they've invested in is actually going to be available for future, future reuse. And I think this very much echoes the comments that, that um, Ingrid has just made about DANS. But also we need to provide our users with standardized data and interoperable services. And, and another key motivator for us, of course, is that we need to actually support compliance with current legal requirements and best practices. So we, all, we need to think about the INSPIRE directive in Europe, but we also are very focused on, on the FAIR principles and find a, making sure that our data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So why did we decide that repository certification was important for us? This, as I've already said, was in part motivated by external pressures to de demonstrate that we can be recognised as a, tr as a trust trusted repository for both our funders, our users, and a range of other stakeholders. But critically, it also was an opportunity for us to benchmark a number of the processes, procedures, and services that um, we have already implement, Im implemented at NGDC against a range of, of recognised standards. And this was, this was quite an important activity. And, and again, I'd like to echo um, a comment that Ingrid has just made that some of these things do get overlooked because they're seen as supporting activities and if resources are short, 
they're the things that tend to get overlooked. So going for repository certification was an opportunity to, for us to really focus on, on these aspects of how the repository functions. But it also meant that we were able to become recognized as a trusted repository for our designated community and ensure that NGDC was differentiated from other repositories. And I think it's also worth mentioning that there are a range of pressures. So, for example, a number of journals are now requesting their authors, authors submit data to a suitable repository. And I think this is increasingly important as the drive towards open science and the implementation of the fair data principles becomes increasingly embedded in the scientific discourse. I think this is this is the, the role of the recognized repository is becoming increasingly important as part of the scholarly publication process in a way that it hadn't done previously. So why did we choose Core Trust Seal? And I should mention at this point that um, we had an interesting experience in that we actually started um, by um, applying for the data seal of approval. But during that process, it became the Core Trust Seal. So we started the protest process applying for a DSA and ended up becoming a Core Trust, Trust Seal approved repository. So for us, the key thing to start with was to identify the most suitable route for becoming a suitable, suitable certified repository. So we started by doing an evaluation of the different levels of certification that were available. And one of the key things for us was the recognition that by looking at how these evolve from quite a basic approach to um, self-assessment offered by the Core Trust Seal, through the Nestor, which is a more extended certification process, through to the formal ISO audit. So we looked at this and started to develop a picture which was more about a entry level certification that we may be able to build on for the future. Sorry. But one of the other things that we did recognize quite quickly was we could also um, turn that triangle on its head in terms of the amount of resources and effort that we would have to invest in this process. So in fact, the basic self-assessment offered by Core Trust Seal meant we could invest um, a reasonable level of resources and then look at ex how much more resources would be required for us to build on that initial Core Trust Seal if we were to move forward to other levels of certification in the process. So once we'd actually chose, chosen the core trust seal process, the next part of it was to actually begin the review process itself. So I'm going to say a little bit that echoes some of the comments that were made at the, in the last um, core trust seal cohort webinar by Rory and say a little bit about our experience of the process of the core trust seal cert repository certification. So the certification process is an iterative process which begins with an initial assessment and there are five areas of assessment that can claim a total of um, 18 areas of assessment. So in order to achieve, um, to undertake this uh, assessment process um, it, in a very similar way to, to the DANS process that Ingrid has just described, we put together um, a task force of selected people involved in different repository activities and you can see their pictures here and I know some of them are online and probably cringing at this moment so apologies particularly to Jana and Ali at this point um, but the key thing was we put together this core team of people who were re responsible for developing our application for the core trust seal but in a similar way to Dan's we also had to uh, interact with a whole range of other people throughout the geological survey who um, were responsible for different aspects of the repository activity. So once we'd undertaken this iterative process, which as I've already mentioned, contains five areas of assessment and uh, 18 different areas um, of recommendations, which included starting off with providing some context for our repository. So for example, the type of repository we are, so which in our case, um, which is a, um, a national repository, 
but also saying something about our designated community, which in our case is we we actually serve a wide range of users from a, from the subsurface uh, geoscience researcher in academia through to local authority organizations and industrial partners. We also needed to say something about our level of curation. And so in terms of NGDC, we actually provide data level curation. But we also then worked through all of the other um, recommendations to actually assess our repository. And finally, we also provided some additional information. And this additional information is basically all of the information that you um, you do not provide elsewhere in the form. So for, in our case, for example, we provide details of relevant ISO certifications we have, um, the staff development activities that are relevant, but also our environmental accreditations to actually demonstrate the robustness of our management systems, but also our commitment to, I, to our staff development and also our attention to our IT security. So for each of those recommendations, you have to provide a compliance assessment, which starts at basically not applicable or the repository is not considered this yet, right through to the guideline has been fully implemented in the repository. And if I actually just put some stars against all of these, you'll see that in the case of NGDC, we'd actually got to the level of either um, underway or fully implemented for the repository. And it is worth saying that the core trust seal assessment is actually an iterative process. And so you don't necessarily have to have fully implemented all of the recommendations in order to achieve the core trust seal. But you do need to demonstrate um, your level of uh, attention to each of these recommendations as part of the process. So once you've actually completed your own internal assessment, um, your core trust seal application is then submitted and it goes out for external review. And then the external review provides in feedback the areas of clarification. Where have you as the repository clearly not stated um, uh, exactly how you've aligned yourself to the recommendations? But it also suggests improvements that are required in order for you to um, continue with your core trust seal once it's been awarded and the areas that you need to focus on within your own re repository for the future. But I think it's the important thing to say here is that once you achieve the core trust seal, it's only for three years. And the nature of the re review process means that you need to aim as a repository for continuous improvement. As I've already mentioned, the feedback from the external reviewers actually helps you to identify where you should focus on your areas of improvement specifically. But I think the key thing is that the core trust seal it should never be considered as a job done, but simply just a milestone for on your road to repository certification and actually maintaining the standard of your repository for the future. I just quickly want to give you an overview of the timeline for NGDC's certification. And we actually started our process and set up our task team that I already mentioned, which is our core team that includes both our repository manager through to those people who are involved in different aspects of the operation of the repository. And we actually started in January 2017 with our initial application for DSA um, being made in June 2017. And I should say that although the timeline has actually taken us a year to achieve the repository certification, this is largely because um, going back to something Ingrid said um, during her presentation, there is always going to be um, other functions within the repository that take priority. And we've had to fit in putting together the documentation for our application for the core trust seal around our repository activities. So in reality, we estimate that it took around three to four weeks of um, full time uh, equivalent for us as a team to complete the repository uh, certification process. And we actually submitted a revised application based on the feedback we'd received from the reviewers in October 2017. 
and actually received our core trust seal uh, certification in January 2018. And, and I'm pleased to say we were actually one of the, the first to receive the new core trust seal. And I just want to, to sort of conclude uh, the presentation uh, from our perspective, just to give you an example of the visibility that we now have in terms of being uh, a certified repository for the core trust seal. So we now have the, the core trust seal logo um, proudly displayed on our web page. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that the documentation um, we submitted for our certification is actually available online. So if you want to take a look at it and use it as um, some guidance for your own process, um, it is available for you to look at. And in fact, all of the um, applications for the core trust seal, the documentation is available online for you to use. And also there is the core trust seals webpage, so you can actually search for different repositories. And I've just uh, pulled up the, uh, the core trust seal page for, for our own repository here in the UK, particularly for those of you who have no idea where Nottingham is located. So I'm just going to conclude by saying a few things about what did we learn from undergoing the repository certification process? And I think the key thing is that we were able to spend some focused time looking at the key strengths and weaknesses in our existing repository processes and procedures um, and actually find out where we, we needed to put in some time and actually look at um, how uh, much of the repository functioned. And one of the key things that we recognised was that actually many of the procedures and standards required to be recognised as a trusted repository were already in place, but sometimes we weren't always following them. So it meant we were able to tighten up a number of our procedures. But critically, it raised general awareness of best practices for data management and long term preservation, not just within our repository, but within the geological survey as a whole which is actually something we struggle to do, trying to convince the average geoscience researcher that preservation of their data or actually submitting their data to an approved repository uh, is important, is actually quite a, an uphill task. We were also able to look at the culture within our repository and identify where we needed some cultural change. But we also recognised that this was an opportunity to imp improve, improve communication both among the repository staff but also more widely with our stakeholders which has been quite an important aspect of our core trust seal uh, journey but it also highlighted the value of regular independent assessment of the NGDC procedures and processes and services and we do recognize that going forward um, we still have work to do because Although we now have our core trust seal for three years, it won't be very long before we are going to have to actually reapply and actually demonstrate that we've improved the procedures in our repository since our previous uh, certification application. So my final slide, I just wanted to give you a pointer to a few useful resources. So I've already mentioned the core trust seal website. That's a really good place to start to get a lot of general information about the certification process, but also the application is there for the for the management tool. So you actually can apply for your core trust seal through the website. But other useful resources are also, as I've already mentioned, the other certified repository applications are available on the core trust seal website. But also ask the repositories. We're quite happy to talk to other repositories who are going through the process. And in fact, we already have provided advice to other repositories applying for the core trust seal. There are also some useful videos online. Um, the CI CSIRO experience in Australia and also the previous core trust seal cohort um, webinar are available on YouTube. And this one, this uh, webinar today will also be available for those who want to refer back to it. OK, and I think that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Does anybody have questions for Helen or Ingrid?
Okay, so um, next steps. Uh, what, what I'm planning to do is send out a survey of people now that um, you've learned more about what's involved in the court, in it, obtaining court trust seal certification. I'm gonna send out an email and a place for people to actually sign up and say they wanna be part of the cohort. These two webinars have been informational and now it's time to see who would like to move forward on this. In addition, um, Rory Edmonds will be at AGU in early December and we'd like to try and put, put together a group, if you're at AGU, we'd like to get together and meet so that people can ask questions in person or talk about what's involved. So I'll be sending out email to those on my list and we'll probably do the same thing we've been doing is the, the broader email list of um, ESIP, um, EarthCube and um, Shelley's list, which is very, very broad and give people an opportunity to join in. Does anybody have questions? Uh, no, but Rebecca, um, if anybody wants a copy of my slide deck, if they just want to drop me an email, I'm more than happy to share. Great. Okay. Rebecca, this is Danny. I have a question and I will apologize first because there's so much construction going out side of my office right now. I don't know if you can actually hear me. Maybe it would be better to text it if you guys can. No, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank uh, both Ingrid and Helen. These were great and I really appreciate you providing your experiences for us. And um, they're great overviews. My, my biggest question or trepidation or curiosity about all this process is as Vico Dima is gathering, sorry, this is Danny Kincaid. I'm from the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office at, at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, as you were going through the process and you assembled your teams and you were gathering information and maybe developing information, um, I guess my question is down in the weeds, how much of the percentage of that time was, was or in what, in what capacity do you provide the information for reviewers? Like does, does all of this need to be accessible um, via your particular repository site? And do you need to make all of this information public? Is there any of it that can be provided to the reviewers, but maybe not, um, you know, not directly maybe accessible I can... on the website? Or can you comment on, on that process of how you provide the information to the reviewers to demonstrate yeah. that you're aligning with the requirements? Yeah, that, can I, do you want me to answer that one, Danny? This is Helen. Sure, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. So, so Danny, I, I mean, our experience here um, at, at NTGC was that a lot of our documentation is available online, but you can provide um, documentation to the reviewers um, without it being available online because we do have some procedures which are not um, exposed um, to the public. public. Yeah. If I may um, say something to that from the perspective of the Core Trust Seal Board. Um, our default, of course, is that we try to be as transparent as possible. So we would really like to see as much of the underlying information as possible to be available online. But we do understand that that part of the information might be um, sensitive information, for example, when it comes to, to um, finance or budgets or, or, or other elements. And then there is always the possibility to only share it with the reviewers and not have it available online. Um, so exceptions are always um, a possibility, but the default um, standard really is that um, trust is based on transparency and please be as transparent as possible um, when it comes to your uh, procedures and processes. Sure, thank sure. you very much. So, so when you when you provide all this, this information and the content online, you're just directing the reviewers to where it lives on your site for, for demonstrating, demonstrating this? Exactly. And in at the end of the process, when um, the seal is, is acquired, then all of the documentation, so the self-assessment as well as the review, is put on the Core Trust seal website. 
And even if you would go to the, uh, the data seal of approval website, which is still in the air, there you can also find um, a long history of, of um, self-assessments and, and reviews. And I think that is a very important knowledge base that people can make use of when they um, work on um, professionalizing their own uh, repository. So I think having that, informa that information available in a public space is, is really very important. Yeah, I, I have to. I have yeah. to say, Ingrid, Danny, I we found the 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 previous applications of Core Trust Seal really helpful, and also DSA really helpful for our own assessment process. I, I don't think you can underestimate the the value of that. I think Ingrid um, is is absolutely right that it's it for, from the repository's perspective, we found that incredibly useful. That's great. Thank you both. I think we're finding as we gather this information, we're also doing this sort of user UI UX assessment of our <laughs> of our content as well, so that people can actually find the content that that is relevant to sort of a little side activity. Yeah, excellent. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Helen and Ingrid, very much. And the recording of um, this webinar will be available probably by tomorrow at the latest. And um, I'll be sending out the survey by the end of the week. And if you have any questions, feel free to email either the presenters or myself, and we'll share that information with, the pe with people who are interested in this process. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn.